So Valentinian is proved to be gullible and weak, and he ends up causing great problems for Rome. After this senator takes over Rome, he also is assassinated, and this leads to about seven years of just death and destruction in Western Rome, starting with the arrival of the Vandals. Just as they had been threatening, the Vandals land on southern Italy, and the people of Italy go into an absolute panic, specifically in the city of Rome. You can think of Rome, it's a little closer to southern Italy, where the Vandals would likely have landed than the city of Ravenna is further to the north. So the people in Rome, they riot and panic. Just as a note, the Vandals' arrival in Rome happens also in 455 in April. The emperor at this time, which was some senator who had assassinated another one, happened to be in Rome at this time, and when the rioting took place, he tried to leave to avoid the panic, but he ended up being killed, I think, by a stray rock in the midst of the rioting. So Rome is left without an emperor and with the Vandals literally on the Italian peninsula heading towards Rome. The Vandals arrived at the city of Rome in April 455 AD, for those of you who will ask, and they break through the gates of the city of Rome. The Vandals rove through the city of Rome, plundering it and pillaging it so much so that their name has been turned into a verb, which literally means to destroy without meaning, to vandalize. Pope Leo again comes to the rescue. He is now referred to as Pope Leo the Great because of these wonderful works he does. He's able to prevent the Vandals from causing wide widespread massacre of the people, but he's not able to completely cause them from destroying the area. In the east, the emperor, who is a guy called Marcian at this point, we haven't talked about him yet. Marcian is spelled M-A-R-C-I-A-N. He is the emperor in the east at this. Marcian doesn't send soldiers to help the west. Basically, Marcian had taken an oath in his past to never fight against the Vandals. There's a reason for this oath. He had been captured by Vandals who had made him take this oath. But for whatever reason, Marcian decides to keep his oath and doesn't send help to Western Rome. That would be an interesting thing for you to look into further about the oath Marcian took to not attack Vandals. Well, chaos and turbulence in Rome. Eventually, the Vandals were driven out of Rome by a man named Rissimer. Mm -hmm. 472, a man named Rissimer rises up and manages to drive the Vandals out of Rome. This is an impressive feat and it gives him a great deal of popularity with the people, but Rissimer has a problem. He has barbarian blood in his body. He's a descendant of a barbarian, so he cannot expect to be made emperor, as we remember. So instead, he recruits his soldier friend named Majorian to be emperor in his stead. Basically, he would rule on Rissimer's behalf. Rissimer is so popular, the Senate approves his recommendation of Majorian for emperor, and Majorian is made emperor. At this time, Western Rome was allied with the Visigoths. They keep getting together and falling apart again. But right now, they're allied with the Visigoths. And they planned an attack on the Vandals. The Vandals had been driven out, but they planned to invade North Africa and actively attack them. Well, the Vandals found out about this attack before it happened. And they went to the coast and they stole Rome's ships before they could set sail to North Africa and attack them. The blame for this failure on Rome's part was put on Majorian, the puppet emperor, and he was assassinated by Rissimer's soldiers, and Rissimer promoted a new puppet emperor in his place. This emperor died of natural causes in 465 and was replaced by yet another. So Rissimer is still in control, but he's had three puppet emperors under him. Well, the Visigoths. Rome was united with the Visigoths under their leader, Theodric II. Well, Theodric II of the Visigoths is replaced, he's killed and usurped by his brother Yurik. In 467, Yurik is the new Visigoth commander. Yurik decides to go on rampage in all the territories that used to belong to Rome, thereby declaring himself as no longer an ally to Rome. So that's an important thing to know. In 472, both Rissimer and his puppet emperor die. Rissimer of natural causes, uh, the puppet emperor of less natural causes, but that is not really important for this particular lecture. What is important 
Putin is that in his place, four emperors came up after him in the space of four years, which means roughly one a year, very quick turnover. None of them were able to take any real power. Finally, a barbarian soldier steps forward to take control. You remember that the barbarians and the Romans is becoming harder and harder to distinguish between them, but there's still this idea that we can't have a barbarian on the throne but they can sure fight our battles for us and they can be on our Senate and they can make a lot of important decisions for us. Well, this barbarian soldier is an important fellow and his name is Orestes. So in the midst of this power struggle with all these emperors rising and falling in rapid succession, we finally have this barbarian soldier named Orestes who rises up and takes over. He gathers behind him an army that includes both Romans and Germanic mercenaries. He tells these Germanic mercenaries that if they fight for him and help him take over Ravenna, he will give them places to live in Italy. They will have settlements and they're more than happy to live in Italy. So they join Orestes and advance on the city of Ravenna, which is currently the capital of Western Rome. He marches on Ravenna and takes control. But since he has barbarian ancestry, which we mentioned, he can't name himself emperor. So instead he chooses his 10 year old son named Romulus. Orestes' wife was fully Roman. So Romulus had less barbarian blood in him than Orestes did. The court at Ravenna is desperate enough. They accept little Romulus as emperor and Romulus is given the title Augustulus, which literally means little emperor, which is kind of a patronizing title given to him by his subjects. He reigned for exactly one year and is the last officially recognized Roman emperor of the Western Empire. So Romulus Augustulus rules from 475 to 476, while Western Rome essentially crumbles around him. The big problem is that Orestes, remember that when he advanced on Ravenna, had promised the Germanic mercenaries that he would give them places to settle in Italy. Well, he had failed to pay up. And the leader of these Germanic mercenaries was a man named Odovacar. And that is spelled like this. Add that to your list of baby names. O-D-O-V-A-C-E-R. Probably a good name for a fish. Odovacar uh, marched on Ravenna and met Orestes in battle in North Italy. Orestes was killed in the fighting and in 476, Odovacar goes to Ravenna and officially deposes Romulus Augustulus. He takes the imperial robes of Romulus Augustulus and he essentially mails them to the emperor in Eastern Rome, which is in effect saying Western Rome is no longer in need of an emperor. Odovacar, instead of trying to claim the imperial title for himself, gives himself the title just king of Italy. With the end of Romulus Augustulus, historians traditionally mark the fall of the Western Roman Empire. The traditions and the culture of Rome will live on for many years. At this point, the Goths and the Germanic tribes and the barbarians have really been influenced by Rome and Eastern Rome remains intact, now referred to as the Byzantine Empire. So Rome's legacy lives on, but looking back in history, this is when we place the official end of the Western Roman Empire. Odovacar, we will come back to, he is a, a short reigned interlude between the reign of Rome and Gothic rule of Italy. And that's where we will pick up in our next lecture. Congratulations, we have killed off Western Rome.